campus here. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for for having us here this this afternoon. I come here before you, um, uh, willing as well to learn from what you have, uh, what your institutions have gathered for the past years of your existence. But I also come here as a practitioner who has uh, deeply engaged with the communities across the country. And uh, part of the sharing that I'm going to give to you right now is actually a product of a common initiative for communal learning uh, that has been done across the world in different continents and has been pulled together in one approach known as the Climate Smart Disaster Risk Management Approach. Its applications we've seen um, uh, extends to many areas of uh, work in disaster risk management and climate change adaptation, uh, including agriculture. So, uh, as my background is said, I'm, I'm not an expert in agriculture. Although my work as a community development specialist um, uh, took me to a lot of other engagements among uh, farmers in Aplan communities uh, working at the Aid on the Peace process and as a uh, part of uh, uh, the community of uh, sea rice. Many of you know sea rice. Uh, many of my colleagues came from UPLB uh, working on uh, farmers' rights. And of course, in our existing work in the humanitarian field, uh, struggling for resilience and search for resilience in the agricultural sector. So, um, perhaps the, the, the question that makes uh, all of us is that Despite the many efforts that we have in the Philippines on disaster risk management and climate change adaptation, where are we now? Okay. As you may all know, uh, in 2009, Philippines uh, passed the Republic Act 9729, which is a climate change law in the Philippines. In 2010, we passed another law, uh, and that is Republic Act 101. Um, to one, which is the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Law. Both of those laws is, are supposed to drive us towards resilience. In fact, they share a common goal. The goal of those two is actually to develop resilient and adaptive Filipino communities and ecosystems. So that's the overall goal. But where are we now? Uh, this is from the 2011 World Risk Index. They came up with a 2012 index, but the, our, 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 our rank did not change. If you look at this distribution for Southeast Asia alone, out of 173 countries, Philippines ranks third as the, the most risky place to live in. It's not because of our exposure to natural hazards. People will normally tell you, oh, of course, it's acceptable that we are in a, we, we, we always have disasters in the Philippines because we're a, a hazard prone area. We sit at the Pacific Ring of Fire, okay? We also are located uh, to welcome all the typhoons that come from the Pacific. But according to this study, it's not the sole reason. Okay? Our vulnerability is high, primarily because we lack coping capacities and we lack adaptive capacities. So for me, that's a very, very interesting thing. In humanitarian work, we often say that coping, lack of coping capacities is almost equivalent to poor learning. Because despite the years of experiencing the same hazards or even intensifying hazards, we do not seem to learn. We make the same mistakes all over again. So, um, so let me introduce to you, uh, in, in, in the search for resilience across the world, there were many who ventured to find pathways to strengthen climate resilience. Because science would say, it's a given. We're heading towards that direction. If the world refuses to change its ways, certainly over the next couple of years, we will see ourselves continue, uh, continually um, welcoming hazards in our doorstep. And, and it's not something that will happen in the future. People normally say that the projections for 2020 uh, is something that we'll see in a couple of years' time. 
but I was reminded by Dr. Rosa Perez, one of our um, Nobel Prize awardee, together with some of your colleagues from the UBL, the 2020 projection has a period of validity, and that is from 2026, I'm sorry, 2006 to 2036. Therefore, the 2020 projection is not in the future, it's here and now. So, um, I'll, I'll be sharing with you uh, a piece of work of, of some practitioners, uh, uh, members of the local government unit, uh, uh, those from academic institutions, who have tried to craft um, an approach known, known as a climate smart disaster risk management approach. So, uh, to introduce to you the initiative, um, the Strengthening Climate Resilience Program was actually supported by uh, David of the, the United Kingdom. And it is, uh, it, it's, it, its aim was to help build the resilience of communities and governments as we all face the changing hazards that we have right now. Okay, so um, the, the methodology uh, starts with um, uh, consultations with different institutions across five continents in the country. And to, to see whether there are better ways no, of dealing with um, our problems of climate change as we also deal with disaster risk reduction. See, in the, in, in the scientific community, there's a big debate. Okay? And also in the social science community. Is DRR the same as CCD? Is disaster risk reduction the same as climate change adaptation? Something that we will seek to answer in a little while. So here in the Philippines, these are the partners of the initiative. So um, we began with a series of consultations, uh, the formulation of a climate smart disaster risk management approach from the perspective of the Philippines. Um, we subjected it to regional consultations in Southeast Asia, uh, and of course, uh, tested the approach uh, by looking into two case studies. And then finally in 2010, uh, launched what is called the Climate Smart Disaster Risk Management Approach. Okay, so just an introduction. Um, earlier I asked uh, whether, a lot of people asked whether DRR is the same as CCT. Uh, we normally say that they are related, uh, they go together, they're married. But they're not, they're not identical twins. They're not one of the same. They may be twins, but they're fraternal twins, but not identical twins. There are a couple of reasons why. Both climate change adaptation and disaster risk management aim to reduce risk. Okay? In the climate science, risk is uh, equal to your hazard, to your exposure, and to your level of vulnerability. In Climate change science, you'd say that risk is equal to your hazard times your vulnerability, where your vulnerability is a function of your exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. I'll go back to this in a little while. So having said that, uh, we know that disaster risk management normally deals with these common hazards to your right. Uh, you have ecological events, geophysical events, climate and weather related events, um, and other events such as uh, technological, uh, human induced, other human induced hazards. Whereas, when you look at climate change adaptation, in the past we, we associated climate change adaptation to um, as addressing hazards that pertain to gradual changes in our climatic parameters. That's why we observe sea level rise, changes in mean temperature, changes in precipitation patterns. But science has been pointing us to the direction that when we study climate change adaptation, we're not only to look at gradual changes in climatic parameters, we now need to look at climate and weather related events, especially those extreme weather events with increased frequency and severity. And this seems to be the nexus between the two. Between the two. So that when we speak 
of both DRR and CCA today both deal with extreme weather events. So these are hazards that are associated with extreme events, whereas the far to your left are hazards that are associated with the changing climate normals. So that is a clear distinction between both. So when you are doing work and and the consideration is only given to current hazards or a timeline, historical timeline of disaster that goes down to about a decade, you may only be doing DRR. Because CCA will require us to actually examine um, climate uh, possible changes related to changing climate in the future. Okay, so uh, yeah, in which case we need to examine climate projections. Now, what is the climate smart disaster risk management approach? Um, it is not really entirely new. As I said, it's a product of the learning of communities from across the globe, five continents. But um, the, the approach outlines three basic pillars. One is to tackle changing disaster risk and uncertainties. Meaning, we will never be climate smart if we do not face our problem regarding hazards. Many communities still attribute hazards uh, as uh, you know, a phenomenon uh, due to their sins. Uh, in, in Ilongo, we call that GAPA. No? Some of us um, speak a lot about DRR and CCA without understanding the hazards. The Climate Smart Disaster Risk Management approach requires that we first have to understand those hazards. We will only be able to do that if we learn to work together. If we exchange ideas, um, we work with, with a lot of humanitarian organizations and communities who, who are battered with hazards no longer year after year, but month after month. You know, some in Mindanao right now it's no longer month after month, it's week after week. And the question they have in their mind is, why is this happening to us? Scientific and research institutions have the answer to that. Unfortunately, much of those information do not reach the communities. So the Climate Smart Disaster Risk Management approach says that communities should collaborate with academic and scientific research institutions. And if possible, scientific and research institutions could translate their scientific knowledge to a form that will be well understood by people in the communities. So, part of that calls for accessibility of the data that you have. So the key question uh, for many of us is, how accessible are our researches, our scientific information, to the communities we wish to serve? Next, we do have researches. Sometimes, yes, we do make them available to communities. But a lot of these researches, you know, are presented to communities piece by piece. Uh, what we learned in the study of DRR and CCA, and, uh, and as I have been introduced, I am not a, a physical scientist. Although uh, part of my PhD was in uh, biosafety regulation, so I had to study hard science. Uh, but for me to understand this area of work, I had to go through the process of what young people now call as no speed with physicists in an attempt to help translate uh, the hard science into a form that will be understood by the communities. But this one calls for integration. Why? I will explain uh, in, in detail much later. Take, for instance, uh, Typhoon Remy, the impacts of Typhoon Remy in Vigo. That alone was not solely due 
increased precipitation. It was a combination of many, many variables, including geophysical hazards, including uh, high tides and low tides, including how people behave to early warnings. So it, it, it would benefit a lot of communities if scientists work together and integrate the information that we have and present them in a more comprehensive manner. And last but not the least, of course, make this learning more accessible to people in the community in a form that will guide decision making. The only way that it will guide decision making is if they understand it. So, the next pillar refers to enhancing adaptive capacity. And I think this is one of my most favorite pillars. Um, the first one may not be new to the scientific institutions, but having worked in many communities in the Philippines, this is something that we lost as a people. This is something that we lost as a people. We no longer experiment. We no longer innovate. You may say that you, we have farmer scientists, but they are only a few. Many of our farmers no longer breed their own seeds. Many of our farmers no longer understand weather patterns. When their ancestors used to, many of them wouldn't know what to do next without agricultural technicians. Or many of them would not know how to grow the seeds that they find without, you know, uh, uh, inputs from seed growers or traders. So this is something that we've really lost. We've lost the capacity to experiment. We've lost the capacity to innovate as people. I'm not talking about the academic institution, but I'm talking about us as a people in general. Uh, and I think that would be fairly seen with our clear investments in science and technology at the community level. When we experiment and we innovate, hopefully we will be able to learn. That learning will hopefully teach us to be more flexible. Adaptation and risk management requires flexibility. Because what may work for one area may not work for another area. Of course, as uh, your, your development planners would say, it would be best also to plan ahead of time. And that's why our laws call for the integration of DRR and CCA in our development plan. We need to plan way ahead of time. Japan, for instance, already knows where they will plant their Fuji apples and cherry blossoms in 2100. And they're already preparing the ground. For that. The third pillar, and this is one that earned the admiration of Governor Salceda <laughs> says that you are only climate smart when your initiatives address poverty and vulnerability and their structural causes. says business as usual will not work and therefore we need to transform the pathway to transformation so that we may be able to adapt to the hazards that are created by the changing climate is when we address poverty and vulnerability and their structural process this is going to be a big challenge for us this is something that we should advocate but this is something that we require empowerment from many sectors in our country. And only then can we truly develop. So that is how simple the Climate Smart Disaster Risk Management approach is. Learn the science, innovate, but make sure that what you learn in the first two pillars will help you address the root causes of our vulnerability. So as I said earlier, um, both DRR and CCA aim at reducing risk. And reduction of risk, risk will require, number one, you can't do anything about the hazard. Of course, 
uh, scientists would tell me now, oh, there's geoengineering. But in the context of the Philippines, we may not be there yet. I don't know how prepared that we are. The world, much of the world is not yet ready for geoengineering, although there are some more advocating for it. But hazard is a given. It's here and now. Sometimes we, we may not be able to do anything about it, but there are things that we can do about our level of exposure, our level of sensitivity to these hazards, and we can do a lot in terms of enhancing our adaptive capacities against these hazards. So let me proceed. The CSDRM approach, you know, has certain suggested pathways. I'll not go to them one by one, but these are the indicators. Okay? So if this one is the, is the first slide and you know, explains the pathways, the second, the next uh, succeeding slide are actually the indicators. Okay. In 2012, um, IBCC, and I'm pretty sure many of you already saw this, released a special report on climate extremes. Um, and this is where they went back to the analysis that um, greenhouse gas emissions certainly affects no? uh, the climate and this uh, we can attribute the anthropogenic climate change to greenhouse gas emissions but what we have right now in terms of our of our climate challenges is not solely due to anthropogenic climate change but there is such an element as natural variability that is what IPCC says and these two okay, together with your weather and climate events, your exposure to these climate events, and your vulnerability can spell disaster risk. Okay. Your level of disaster risk will also determine our development paths. So if, if ever we do want to develop, we need to implement DRM, disaster risk management, and climate change adaptation. So that's the gist of the SRS report. But to do that, according to, to SREX, there are things that we need to focus on. We need to vigilantly reduce exposure, our exposure to those hazards. And by our, I don't only mean exposure of human beings, but also um, exposure of the biophysical elements in this world, and it's highlighted in that particular report, okay? We need to increase our resilience to change, changing risk. We need to prepare, respond, and recover. We need to reduce vulnerability. We need to transfer and share risk. But more importantly, we need to change our ways. We need to transform. That is what SREP says. So it's not that complicated. If disasters are caused by hazards, our exposure, our sensitivity to those hazards, and our lack of adaptive capacity, all that we need to do, according to science, is to reverse that. Meaning, reduce our exposure, reduce our sensitivity, enhance our adaptive capacity by doing all of these. Now, for CSDRM, what were our lessons learned? Okay. So I told you that CSDRM approach uh, was tested in several countries. And uh, some of the things we learned are the following. Currently, we are tackling disaster risks and uncertainties, but not potential risks resulting from climate change. So if you notice, many of our programs are either reactions to the hazards that have already struck us. Uh, sa Pilipinas po, maraming programa sa area na na-disaster. That's, that's our pattern. You know, you don't know Albay because it had a disaster and they implemented a lot of programs. You know St. Bernard because they had a disaster and there were a lot of programs uh, that, uh, you know, that, that have been implemented there. It's a common story, you know. But we do not give attention to communities that have survived the hazards. We give attention to communities that suffered from the hazards 
experience disaster from the hazards and did something about it. So, currently, if you review the programs in the Philippines, we have a lot of programs dealing with disaster risk and uncertainties. But, in the Philippines, we have not yet seriously talked about our risk in the future that may happen due to climate change. Hindi pa po natin ang pag-uusapan. At ang pag-uusapan po natin in few days, sasabihin nyo meron tayong NCAP. Diba? Pag ilang taon na po tayo nag-uusap tungkol dyan. Uh, yes, you tell me about a lot of programs that we have. You know? But if you count the number of municipalities that we have in the Philippines, uh, we have over 1,500. We have 44,000 barangays. Um, and we have about 80 plus provinces. Count the number of pilot projects that we have in the country. We haven't reached 50%. Not even 30%. And a lot of times, we keep doing the same projects in areas that already have some of the projects implemented. But many of, of the, the areas that need our help the most, like small island communities, upland communities, have not yet actually been visited by any development programs. So, one thing that we also learned is that there are many projects in the Philippines right now that allow us to develop uh, coping capacities. No? Like we have disaster preparedness programs. No? Uh, there, are, 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 there, there are disaster preparedness programs in both agriculture and fisheries. But we still do not have very clear programs okay, or we have very little of programs that aim to develop adaptive capacities. Marami po sa mga ginagawa natin ngayon for the past year has been vulnerability assessments. Marami po. No? And uh, I'm pretty sure your institutions have been involved in this one. And finally, um, we had a great debate about this in the Philippines in 2009. Should we focus on mitigation or should we focus on adaptation? Pinag-ewayan po yan. So that when you read, for example, the National Framework Strategy on Climate Change, you will see uh, that the boxes for mitigation and adaptation differ in sizes. That is the product of the debate. No? Because communities, uh, different stakeholders uh, kept lobbying that the government, while we do recognize that we have to contribute to mitigation, we have to face the fact that the issue for the Philippines is survival. And therefore, we need to give more emphasis to adaptation rather than to mitigation. But the money is in mitigation. That's why it is attractive to a lot of local government units. But in reality, what our communities need is to adapt. And this is where I think institutions like Sharka um, can help. We really need to reclaim our power to experiment and innovate. Since we've lost that capacity, uh, we will not be there for all of these communities all of the time. And therefore, the best way for them to survive the hazards is to learn in their own way how they will manage and how will they, they will face these hazards when they come. But they will only do so if they again regain their power to experiment and innovate. I'll show you some of the examples later on, like this one. Okay? This picture was taken in northern Quezon. Okay? This is a picture of a farmer uh, in the upland community of northern Quezon who worked with several scientific institutions. Uh, to get a community-based early warning system functioning. And um, recently, Project NOVA 
try to contact that community because they wanted to partner with them. Okay, uh, but they did their own, you know, with the help of the scientific institutions. Uh, they studied um, rain gauges, you know, uh, they measured uh, the depth of the river, width of the river, speed of the, of the river, uh, they, they marked the mountains, yeah? and they learned to compute. If this is the amount of rainfall, how much would be the volume that would most likely go down the communities? And they developed their own community-based early warning system. This is the same community that with the help of UBLB uh, earned uh, the UN Sasakawa distinction for uh, the soil modality testing post the 2004 disaster in Northern Quezon. So there, let me just present to you some of the attempts of LGUs and other stakeholders. I'm pretty sure you have heard about this in Dumanga, Silido. The initiative some started early in 2000, but you see, kind of weird that it, it did not pick up across the country. This is the climate forecast application in Dumanga, Silido that was initiated by PAGASA together with the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, uh, Columbia University, and the municipality of Dumanga, Silido. Uh, this is the first in the Philippines, I think the second in Asia. Uh, this has propelled Dumangas to become number one, the number one rice producing town, municipality in Milpino, and has overtaken Mina, Pototan. And if you know Dumangas in Milpino, they are at the tail end of the Halaur River system. So they're flooded annually. But despite the annual hazard, in their case, they have become a number one uh, food-producing municipality in the province of Iloilo. So, investments were interesting. They only set up an agrement station. An agrement station that and developed together with the province of Iloilo and their other partners, a climate field school that informs the farmers about the, you know, uh, near, they, they are given uh, uh, not long-term projections, you no, know, but uh, uh, near forecast, which means forecast for for months or for the next six months or for the next week, for example, and based on that they plan. So, I'm I'm pretty sure you many of you have already heard about uh, the agrobed station. So. Um, these are some of the details of their, their agricultural um, interventions uh, with, the, with the help of uh, their climate forecast applications. Um, Dumangas is into third cropping every year. So, yan po yung mga interventions nila. Next, you must have also learned about, heard about uh, weather uh, index-based insurance or weather-based insurance indices. Uh, the first that we had in the Philippines was also in Iliido, although um, it was first developed somewhere else in the world, but um, the, the first office is in Iliido. Uh, and this is with MicroInsure Philippines. So we develop, we develop a crop-based weather index, and I'll show you later on. Um, and and it, it provide each provided insurance for for crops uh, against drought, wet and dry day cover typhoon primarily. And their first test was typhoon frack in uh, 2008. And then we also have uh, the crop-based insurance of the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation. Uh, uh, together with uh, ILO and was uh, implemented in Agusan, Del Norte. And we also have, of course, a National Catastrophe Insurance, but this time this, is, um, this, this was implemented by cooperatives and funded by GIZ and uh, the Germans. Okay? So, MicroInsure considers, for example, the rain use of the typhoon. If you are within the radius of the typhoon, 
most likely you will receive insurance. You know? Um, so, pinag-aaralan po nila to. Okay. So, this is an example they have of typhoon crap. So, pag medyo malayo-layo ka at wala ka sa radius, baka yung pagkasira ng crops mo hindi dahil sa bagyo. Baka something else. This is uh, the flow chart of how they implemented uh, the weather-based uh, insurance in uh, Agusan del Norte. So you have, of course, a uh, uh, projection that enters into the information system. And then they work with uh, PCIC and aggregators to ensure, uh, ins uh, to ensure farmers. Uh, their target here is basically uh, equity and uh, equality. So um, these are some of those that are covered by their these insurances. Low rainfall, excessive rainfall, continuous dry days, continuous rainy days, uh, among others. So, but, but we have to remember that the project in Agusa is an entire financial package. No? Uh, and it involved um, one city, ten municipalities. And it was done as part of the MDGF 1656 project. Uh, where many of you are already involved in. Okay, so uh, they, they, they gave attention to the determinants of uh, climate change, uh, adaptive capacity to climate change, which are improving and the need to improve the economic condition and the availability and access to financial and productive resources. Uh, ang problema kasi, marami sa mga, mga small-scale farmers natin, talagang walang access sa crop insurance. Uh, if you review, you know, the PCIC terms, uh, they will be made available to medium-scale and, you know, uh, large-scale farmers, but not, but not to small-scale farmers. That's why they had to have aggregators in this part, in this kind of project. Okay. But they, of course, um, made sure that this is a package of both insurance and credit to ensure that the farmers continue producing despite the hazards they face. Now, uh, there are other attempts uh, related to agriculture that I'd like to share to you. But now, these attempts are not, no longer just institutional. They're not implemented by LGUs. They're implemented by community-based organizations in partnership with academic institutions. Uh, uh, risk mapping and typhoon tracking, this is now being done in many uh, small islands in the Philippines. Um, and this is the, the project that has, I've been telling you about in Northern Quezon. So ito po, hindi po to scientists. Talaga magsasaka to. Tinuluan na po siya na uh, kilagin po si Dr. Siti David. Hindi ko ba na yung pinigs? Uh, siya po yung nagturo sa kanila kung paano pag-aralan ang galaw, ang hubis ng ilong. So, ginawa po nila sila yung nag-measure, you know, sila nag-determine, and then uh, they connected this with software and uh, tools for development of risk assessments. Uh, combine this, this one is in uh, the Pico River Basin, outland area of the Pico River Basin. Ito po ay uh, nasa tuktok po sila ng bundok. They're trying to come, come, uh, come with home-based weather stations that were linked to uh, Naga College's Foundation. If you know, if you've been to Naga, there's a young man there who has been very dedicated to, to help uh, the Bicol region you know, prepare for hazards. His name is Michael Padua. Uh, he set up an office at, at uh, the Naga College's Foundation. So together with other institutions um, um, uh, from, from Manila, they help set up um, you know, a system where they can capture data that were sent by, by these households uh, by SMS and then they computed, computed that and then they returned them to the community for early morning. Um, there, you know Phil Rice and you've also known um, uh, and, and you also do this kind of work here. Uh, this is in Zamboanga, Sibugay. Binabaha to para yung area to. Uh, we sought the help of Field Rice to help this community. 
But instead of getting the submergent rice variety that they already have, they looked for upland varieties and then tested it. So ito po, nadiskubihan nila na meron pala silang variety na flood resistant din. Pero ito ay upland rice variety. Ito naman po ay sa isang upland community sa Pajaman in Ido. Ang naging problema po nila dito ay bigla pong palagi na silang binubuhusan ng malakas na malakas na plan. So the term that they have is natutunaw yung aming mga pananin because they're vegetable farmers. So they try to find ways to protect their vegetables because that's the only thing they know. They're in the area, they do not have much land for, for rice cultivation and they would want to continue um, uh, uh, farming vegetables. Um, in this same community, during dry days, they developed their own there was one community who only knows how to plant talong. Pero pag dry season, nahihirapan sila magpatubo ng talong. Pero sa experimentation nila, nakadevelop po sila ng isang talong na tinawag nila tashort. Tashort. Kasi, nadiskubihan nila, pag marami ng tubig, hahaba yung talong. Pero pag konti ng tubig, pwede namang magtanim ka ng talong, pero maiksi lang siya. So, they call it tashort. And then, they continue to market it as tashort from that upland community. And so, whether it rains or it dries, they can still plant and sell talong. Okay? Kaya lang, tashort na nga pag uh, shorter siya. Um, in this same area, you know, when they found ways that they, they would be able to plant no, and protect, protect their crops from heavy rainfall, they discovered that they had surplus. No? They tried to market them somewhere else, then they discovered that they still had more. So they sought the help of the University of the Philippines in the Visayas School of Technology. And they're saying that whenever, you know, the hazards strike and we end up in disasters, we're always fed with noodles. Is there a way that we can be fed with healthier food? So they tried to desiccate the vegetables. If you've been to Iloilo, Ilongos like to eat laswa. It's just all vegetables. It's pinasayang gulay. It's like pinakbet without your bagoong and your pork. But it's a clear soup. So what they did is to test and to desiccate it, they put in flavor. They've already run into the food testing and they're now trying to develop this further for marketing. Uh, this one is from uh, Sorsogon. In Sorsogon. In Sorsogon, there are communities there that no longer can fish as much as they wanted to because the seas have become either rougher or they cannot stay longer at sea because uh, the temperature at sea has now become very high. So if before they would stay at sea for about 7 hours, ngayon hanggang tatlo na lang daw kasi napakainit daw talaga ng tubig sa dagan. They can no longer stay. And the story goes that whenever uh, this happens to them, there would be a massive economic migration. So when we were there uh, nearly a decade ago, ang kwento nila ay uh, dito po sa amin, pag nangyari po ito, like abad, habagat lang, o amihan lang, no? when the seas are really rough or uh, drought strikes, uh, you know, we, they, they suffer from the phenomenon of economic migration and dahil noon ay hindi pa masyadong mura ang cellphone, no? uh, nagkakahiwalay talaga yung mga pamilya. It is in this community where we discovered that uh, ang dinanakaw, hindi na pera, kaldero na. Ibig sabihin, nung nagsasain ka, mawawala lang yung kaldero mo. So, they were in, in desperate search for alternative livelihood. So, we asked them, are you really looking for, for alternative livelihoods or supplemental livelihoods lang? But they say, no, time will come that it will be difficult for us to fish. 
we need to look for alternative livelihoods. So using asset-based mapping, they discovered that in very, very poor communities, there are only two assets that they can have. We tested this, pilot tested, um, you know, the, the approach that was developed, which is a gender-based approach in a very poor rural community. Ayaw nga siyang punta ng ibang development workers kasi pag pumupunta sila doon, nagkakasakit sila. Kasi nga, marumi yung tubig. It was so poor. Uh, and um, uh, the only assets that the communities they discovered they had were, one, screw pines, uh, which they call karagumoy, for those of you who are from Ecol. No? Uh, alam niyo po yung screw pines? Parang siyang uri ng palm tree, pero kaya lang, uh, the leaves are tougher. Okay? And then they discovered that they had seagrass. You know? Pero yung seagrass na hindi sa dagat, yung swept away. And they had their household waste. So, with that to work with, they, they approached scientific institutions again. You know? uh, scientific institutions helped them to soften the karabumoy because one of the cultural assets of the people was that they knew how to be. Okay? So they made a long story short, they started weaving karagumoy. With, uh, with the seagrass that they have and the household base, they were de able to develop a, what they call a soil conditioner. The purpose of the soil conditioner is to enable them to plant in coastal areas. Hindi kasi sila tatalig doon, di ba namimili lang sila. So kung wala silang pera pamili, hindi sila makakain, no? They wouldn't have very healthy food. So what they did was uh, to develop a soil conditioner. Now that community, this these communities, you know, they've already exported their products to Japan. And uh, this community also have started planting vegetables, vegetables like lettuce, sa coastal area. Di ba hirap nun? Oh, pero nagawa ko nila. So this is a community of women. Uh, those are some of their products. Uh, DSWD saw the project, added uh, some more money to the community-based organization that first started this, and then uh, multiplied the initiative in many parts of, of Sorsogon. Uh, ACIM, from the, you know, the development agency of the Spanish government, saw the initiative, made an investment for three years. No? Uh, for about 11 million and then multiply their efforts uh, many times over. Right now, the problem of the community is that they're not able to have all of these products, right? Uh, but then they discover that one day they may run out of karabumoy. So they need to plant karabumoy. So it was easy to help them buy a lot so they can plant karabumoy. When they had this, they discovered that uh, they were on a roll, you know, producing this. But then they discovered that, oops, they cannot dry the leaves because the, the rains have become more frequent. So they tried to innovate and discover their own, uh, you know, innovated and experimented on dryers with the help of retired employees of the DOST. So ngayon may mga tatlo silang models ng dryer sa area na yun. So, kaya, continuous yung pagpoproduce nila. So, this, uh, I try to show you. Uh, this one is another, in another upland community in in Pilino. They had two problems. So, pag umuwala, di ba sabi, natutunaw yung kanila mga tanim. So, they ask the question, when it rains, what do human beings do? What? Nagpapayong. Diba? Sabi natin, payungan kaya natin yung ating pananin. So they did that. You know, they made silos. But then they discovered that water would seep in. Diba? So, you know, too much water and then they find that, that their plants would have built in the morning. So they said, is there a way for us to actually evacuate our plants when it rains or when it dries up. Because when it rains, human beings run. Right? We seek for shelter. Can plants do that? That's what, that is what it is. So they developed this. Okay? 
Ngayon po, having shared this in several areas in the Philippines, if you're on Facebook, you will see a community known as UKG, you know, home, uh, this, like this is an organization of home-based gardeners. They developed and innovated on this. So, nilagay na nila sa ibang-ibang mobile uh, platform. So, ito po kawayan. Ito po, pag masyadong malakas ang ulan, kukunin po yan nila, tapos itatakbo sa bahay nila, ilalagay nila sa gilid ng bahay nila. They hang it at the side. No? Yun. Ganun din pag maigit. But this one is in a platform. See? Uh, when it's dry season, they know, know that they have to stay on water. They, they start, you know, watering the plants here. And then if you see, meron mga pananin dyan sa baba. So that water is wasted. And our partners in uh, Davao, ang iba gumawa ng pans sa iba ba? Para hindi pa mas hand to day. Para meron pang mag-benefit ng mga isda. It works. I tell you. So, there have been very many innovations of this uh, simple kind. The question are, these are great attempts, but are these really climate smart DRR attempts? Meaning, are, are these enough? Okay, so let's go back to, to this. Okay. Uh, we discovered that so far, we've been dealing with current hazards. Hazards that we've uh, encountered for the last decade. And siguro we're encountering now, and we will encounter for the next uh, five years. But we need to plan for hazards that we will meet in 2020, 2050, 2100. So the innovations that were made may have to be calibrated against hazards future hazards. But we need the help of scientists to help us understand the nature of those hazards. We need scientists to help us characterize those hazards. So for example, uh, um, we really tried doing it no, and showing them the climate projection of Pagasa that in some areas the temperature would rise at 1.2 in 2020 and another 2.2 by 2050. Sabi ng mga magsasaka, Ano yung ibig sabihin mo? Ano yun? Ano mangyayari kung 1.2? Kung 2.2? So far, what we only know uh, is what happens to rice in the evening. Pero hindi namin alam kung ano mangyayari sa saluyok, sa talong, sa okra, at marami pang iba. Hindi lang po kasi rice ang produkto ng Pilipinas. Marami pang iba. No? Uh, in one... Uh, uh, engagement that we have with, with LGUs from Eastern Visayas, um, uh, a woman from an LGU of, of uh, Leyte at Summer actually told me, Ma'am, you should not teach me about coconut because I know our coconuts and our winds. If you say that your coconut here at the wind speed of 175 only gets scared and freezes, Sa amin po, hindi lang po natatakot yung coconut namin na puputol-putol. Para silang pinag-chap-chap-chap. Yung sinasabi nyo dito na habaga, sa amin po dinubyo ng hulog. So, we need to understand these things. So, uh, possible entry points for, for agriculture. You know? And, this is an area that I have been but I know that you're already heading at this direction. But but uh, for now, this is one area where we will need the help of scientists, the scientific community, like Sharka. Uh, so I, I already uh, told you this. Uh, uh, why do we need to understand this, the distinction between DRR and CCA? and how they come together. What we will do today, according to SREX, will help us build our capacities for tomorrow. Ang tawag dyan ni Dr. Rosa Perez at ng IPCC, incremental adaptation. Magsimula tayo sa DRM. As we continue to learn, surely pagdating siguro ng 2020, mas matalino tayo. Pero simulan na natin ngayon. 
because we are facing new climate extremes, new hazards. I'm pretty sure you've actually uh, already heard what happened to Mindanao. Uh, hindi na po to phenomenon na once in a lifetime, once in a hundred years. This will become more frequent. The sad thing is that the scientists already projected this in 2005. Our colleagues from Mindanao, when we presented the science, said, hindi yan mangyayari kasi wala talagang bagyo sa Mindanao eh. So they did not believe us. They invited them to, to join a program for DRR. They said, um, hindi kasi yung DRR sa amin, ano lang eh, human induced hazard lang yung kailangan namin. So peace building sa amin yung project. We're trying to explain, imagine the difficulty that you will have if your if your human induced hazards like armed conflict will be met by another form of hazards like climate hazards that they said hindi So in 2009, when they had their first study in Cagayan de Oro, they said we should have listened. In 2010, when it happened again, they said we hope it's not too late for us. Then, Sendong happened. Uh, here are some attempts so far. Uh, you must have heard of uh, the work you know, that was uh, done by GIZ, the World Agroforestry Center, and Manila Observatory in Silago, Leyte. This is a kind of thing that we will need. Uh, science is already telling us that the impact of climate change is going to be context-specific. We have provincial level projections. We need to localize them. Pukunti lang po yung climate scientists namin sa Pilipinas. Baka gusto niyo pong dagdagan. Okay? Because we have 7,100 or so islands and we need to do this for each of our islands. Okay? This is only in Silago Lede. And this one will tell you that the, the climate change will not be equal, no? So, my temperature increase ka dito na, let's say, two degrees per dito, baka mas mainit tingnan. Sorry. What we will need to do if we have this is to plan way ahead of time what can be planted in these areas. Uh, and uh, if you go to this book that they had on Silago Leyte, you will find initial attempts. No? So ngayon pa lang, sabi na na sa LG, yun na baka yung ibang pananit na ipat nyo dito. No? In Malinduque, for instance, the LGU have now invested, purchased a lot in the upland community and they have started planting root crops. They have also worked with the Malinduque State University to develop a new staple for Malinduque. Uh, a mixture of rice and root crops. Kasi inaasahan nila that in a couple of years time, baka hindi na magiging productive ang you know, uh, rice production sa Marinuque. Uh, this is one big attempt of the Phil Cup project, uh, which is to build a dam uh, in in uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, The initiative is currently being questioned, but it's a big you know, it's a it's a project that has received you know large scale funding of about 13 billion. The plan is to come up with a dam that will sustain the water needs of the agricultural lands in the region. So yan po yung plan nila. No, yung concern po ngayon ay this is the area covered. This is what the climate projection says. So medyo tama ang ilalagay mo dyan. Kaya lang po, lumabas sa susceptibility na na baka this area may be also prone to rainfall in those landslide. So, there is a separate assessment for this. Is there a separate assessment for this? For us to have a better picture of what our challenges will be, uh, we need to combine those assessments. Okay. So, um, we, we really need push for integration in the work for climate smart DRM. Uh, we also need to be able to come up with a knowledge base that will inspire learning, innovation, and experimentation among our people. Now, um, sometimes
times there are working agriculture that there might not be an importance in development. Uh, our, our advocacy right now is to make sure that the, your work gets into development plans. No? And just to share with you how um, we've attempted this, an alternative pathway to mainstreaming DRR and CCA in development planning. Uh, if you look into our plans in the Philippines, you only have, we have a common goal, which is sustainable development. So, dapat all our efforts should lead towards that. So, whether it's NCCAP or NDRM plan or agricultural plan, dapat pumasok po siya dyan. Uh, siguro ang katanungan ng iba, kung mahalaga yung agrikultura, ba't hindi ko siya nabibigyan ng emphasis ng mga NGUs kadalasan? Kasi ang sagot po dyan, hindi po siya pumapasok sa development plan ng NGUs. Kung kayo po ay magre-review ng NGU plans, ng development plans ng NGUs, uh, do a decadal analysis. And you will find that they write the same things all over again. Okay? So, you will have uh, seedlings dispersal. You know, uh, kung ano pa yung, yung swine fattening. Ganun-ganun po yung mga common uh, um, mangrove reforestation. Paulit-ulit po yan ng mga projects. No? And kung yan yung gagawin natin, hindi talaga tayo pat mag-a-adapt. So, uh, um, for those of you in the agriculture and who wants to do advocacy for 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 LGU so that they give emphasis to agriculture and agriculture and development, this is something that we need to study because this is how confusing our development process is. Okay, for you to ensure that there's a budget for agriculture, we have to go through all of this. Hindi naman po siya actually ganun hihirap kung pag-aaralan natin. Pero mahirap na po talaga kung hindi po pag-aaralan. Okay, so an uh, initial attempt uh, and part of this was the strengthening climate resilience was to simplify the process for LGUs. But when we showed this to LGUs in 2010, they said, hmm, okay, no? tested it in 11, works, but can you please simplify it? And then they said, how simple do you want it to be? Can you make it into 12 steps? So we work together with LGUs and then come up with, came up with 12 steps. Um, the 12 steps will take you to uh, a vulnerability assessment that uses the same criteria that our scientists use, no? looking to exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, but what we're discovering right now is that uh, We need to be able to study this, all of this. If we need to understand the climate change and ecosystems. Last week we had, uh, although the week before last, we had a scientific conference no? uh, in, in Manila. And then, do we, we ask the question, do we have enough science to begin DRR and CCA work, serious DRR and CCA work in the Philippines? Our scientists say there will never be enough science, but we have to start somewhere. Okay. So, but uh, IPCC tells us that if we want to do serious work on DRR and CCA, we need to study all these essential climate variables. Not only rainfall, not only increasing temperature and sea level rise, but we need to study all of these things. Huh? Water vapor, radiation budget, etc including terrestrial variables such as river discharge, water use, groundwater, lake levels, which many of our LGUs do not study. Okay. Um, current science also tells us that we also need to study what they call EBVs, or essential biodiversity variables. No? So, hindi pa nga tapos yung essential climate variables, which are about 50 variables, you have another EBVs, which are another 50 plus variables. But don't worry, we're, we're, we're not really behind the pack because the other countries haven't started theirs yet. But what will this tell us is that um, when we talk about climate change and its impact on agriculture, we really need to study its impact per crop, per species.
Eh, wala pa po tayo doon. So, baka po, that's, that's an area of development that, that we can put forward. This is very interesting field. Very cutting edge. Uh, not many are into this at this point. Uh, one of the most debated approach we have is the ecosystem space approach. You know? But we took on uh, the UNEP uh, definition you know, of, of the ecosystem space approach so that when we help LGUs identify programs, plans, and actions to help reduce exposure, reduce sensitivity, and develop adaptive capacity, we ask them to ask them themselves one more question. Are these programs, plans, and projects contributing to the enhancement of ecosystem services? Because the way we do it right now is that we look at how we can we can earn money from our eco, you know, the resources from the ecosystem. We take we took the other side, you know, of the approach and say, if you want to do a project, let's say build a bridge, or build a toilet, or build a building, or build a highway, you know, uh, ask yourself, are you contributing to the enhancement of the ecosystem services or not? If not, there then must be something wrong with, with the approach, if we are to stick with the ecosystem space approach. Um, we need the science to, infor, to develop informed CCA DRR options. Ito po yung kailangan ngayon ng ating mga LGUs. So, um, if they know their level of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, they can develop programs, plans, and actions to help reduce exposure, reduce sensitivity, and increase adaptive capacity. Now, why are we insisting on this? Uh, because the format for development planning requires them to come up with PPAs. So we'd rather that they put PPAs that are informed by risk assessment rather than any other PPAs. So this is uh, the recent format on the use of the Local Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Fund issued by COA in September of 2012, uh, uh, in 2000, uh, 2012, 002. And this is the standard format of the uh, annual investment plan that all LGUs have to fill up. You know, municipalities and cities and barangays. So your risk assessment can result to the RR and CCA options that can be transformed into programs, projects, and activities for the annual investment plan that goes into here. You know? Once it gets into the AIP, it gets to be deliberated upon, and then it gets to be uh, legislated on. So it comes out at, as an ordinance. And all expenditures of the LGU for that year will be based on the AIP. That's why we're making for, for an appeal. Uh, there are different sectors, development sectors, uh, in, in uh, the annual investment plan. Limat, uh, Ang analysis po nila sa physical, institutional, environmental, social, and economic. Pero pagdating po sa budgeting, apat na lang yan. General services, social, economic, and others. So pagdating po sa apat, saan papasok ang agriculture? Economic ba, social, others, or, or general services? So that's why we're sharing this information with you so that when you get to work with local government units, we also hope that your uh, green initiatives to help the country uh, will find their way into development plans of, of uh, the Philippines. So I think that's where I end my presentation. Marami salamat po. Ms. Brasilia for that highly informative presentation. The floor is now open for our audience to direct their comments and questions to our speaker. Please use the microphones around the group and kindly introduce yourself and the organization you are currently connected with. 
who wants to throw the first question? Yes, the from Mars. Hi, Mars. Uh, just current events. Uh, we, you showed the Dumangas uh, weather station, and they were supposed to be predicting back for six months. But they had Pablo recently, and they were actually uh, uh, no, victim. Do you have anything? Yeah. Actually, ma'am, we just, uh, we were only there last week. Okay. Um, that's why I asked. Remember, if you look at the presentation, I put uh, the Dumangas at them in the first first set of presentations. And then I asked a question at the end of that section. Are these climate smart disaster risk management approach? Uh, what we're now learning is that you have uh, near cast and you have forecast and then you have projections. Um, the climate, the agrobet station, in the mangas makes near cast and forecast, but not projections. Right. So um, uh, the extreme events like Pablo is definitely a phenomenon that can be categorized in what the IPCC calls as the new normal. Okay. It's a new normal because uh, while it is predicted that it has been predicted that there will be naturally typhoons, you know, uh, in in the Visayas, but the movement of typhoon since typhoon Frank has been tracked by many climate scientists. And what they discovered is that when the typhoons crosses the Visayan seas, it gains strength. Okay. Uh, in fact, at the morning of typhoon Pablo. Uh, nandumaan po siya sa, sa, sa Western Visayas. Uh, Dr. Nasser Bando said, oh, it's now going out. Now, towards the direction of Palawan. So, we may not actually experience, if you look at the eye of the typhoon, it will not directly hit okay, uh, the island of Panay, although it is, Panay would still be within the rain shoes. What the scientists uh, recently discovered is that the rain bands of the typhoon shifted from the center to the side, to the wall of the typhoon, thus hitting uh, the, the municipalities near the, the Lumangas area. Um, the, the LGUs there reported that they didn't experience extreme rainfall. So they were asking, why such a volume of water? So currently, ma'am, the analysis is still ongoing. So far, we've only reached the level that they've seen the sh uh, shift mm -hmm. of the rain bands from the center to the wall of the, to, of the typhoon, hence actually causing the rainfall in that, uh, in that part of, of Panay. But as to why such was the volume of water that came down you know, uh, in the Halao River Basin, they're still trying to uh, uh, collect and gather data from different municipalities. But true, ma'am. Dumangas will tell you that we prepared for it, but we do not know. Uh, we never expect that, that the volume of rain that will come down to us will be this much. So that's why I ask a question. Is the agromet climate smart enough? It seems that we need to do more. Because so far, it has done near cast and forecast. It's, it might need, need to integrate the phenomenon of of uh, the extremes, the new climate extremes in their analysis. Any other question from the yes, sir? Mark Bumilia, Peter Rice. Thank you for mentioning that uh, <laughs> flood resistant uh, rice. But uh, aside from that, uh, just one is an observation and the other is an insight and the other is a question. Um, Actually, the rice is doing uh, more than what I have shown, and uh, some of this aside from their basic to apply research and development aspect. And uh, you, know, you have already, we, we, we have limited uh, work also with the uplands and the indigenous people about uh, something related to this. But uh, my, my first, uh, I'd like to commend you for the very comprehensive scope uh, to be too comprehensive, too smart for us also. Uh, 
uh, good for the scientists and the general audience, but uh, so policy makers, you know, especially the policy makers. <laughs> but what I'm saying now is, those, uh, uh, let me flash on figure one, climate smart uh, stuff. I call that the, uh, you know, uh, one jigsaw puzzle chart, the three pillars. Okay, that and the succeeding uh, illustration uh, I mentioned, Maganda, very comprehensive and interrelationship. Now, what I want to put in perspective is, and I mean, the bagay mo mga agencies na involved, the bagay mo yung mga yung examples ng lo local initiatives. But the major problem natin at this point is. Siguro part of part of this the nationwide policy na may IPCC may uh, version tayo ng national IPCC and mga sa some scientists are here but uh, um, um, some problem at in terms of mga development uh, entry points in all this that are not like you mentioned about uh, these four and then two experiments for institutions pero pero this LGU we have a very, we have a tremendous problem in terms of uh, uh, not just adaptation and mitigation, but mismo adapting the policy and the framework. Uh, I'm sure may hirap pa sila pag ginawa nila yung tinigagawa ng COVID ngayon. Kasi some of us who are involved with the LGU preparation, kahit yung simple agricultural plan nila and uh, mitigation or up Sabi mo nga kanina, it's only to it lang for the last pag-inanalyze ng decadal analysis. Now, what more itong ano ng COA na naka ano lang into four pero very comprehensive in scope. And lagi sinasabi na yan, pondo, pondo, lagi pondo, and all that. So, but what I'm pointing out is how do we localize so much of this uh, global, sinasabi na ito, labas natin na may think global at local. But if I think sa local government unit, uh, the case of Albay, the case of Leyte, are more exception than, uh, than, uh, than the rule here. Of course, we have some initiatives in Palawan, some initiatives in Mindoro, where our other area of responsibility, because also other area of responsibility namin. But completely na mga, not even 10% LGUs, or I would say that even 5 to 10 percent of LGUs are, have programs connecting their programs, local programs, including uh, employment, enterprises, agriculture, and the like. Now, they have links to climate uh, readiness, uh, climate change adaptation, and the like. So, ang, ang, ang nasa, nasa mind ko ngayon is, how do we make it, aside from getting them the information alam na nila, pero how, how do you put into action, a better action, uh, into the like, local levels, itong mga pinag uh, papunta ko dito ng very sound naman and very prophetic cities? Uh, sir, I did not anymore explain this in detail, but we did recognize the dilemma that you presented. No? Um, in the absence of a current guideline for localization. Um, there were several um, stakeholders that bonded together to come up with this alternative pathways uh, for mainstreaming DRR in local uh, development plans. So as I said, um, the, the track was to get first, no? a requirement kasi na yon, is to get the DRR and CCA mainstream into municipal, city, barangay plans. No? So, ito mo na yung inuna namin tinarget, annual investment plan. Uh, so, this is the hierarchy of plans in the Philippines. Uh, we had to start at this particular level. Pero we, we started at uh, influencing the local development investment program. Okay, so... Uh, that's why I showed you this because mainstreaming will actually ask of us to mainstream CC and CC climate change no? and DRR in, in all of these levels. Now, our task, 
para sa amin is that there are attempts kasi for vulnerability assessments right now, but it ends in vulnerability assessments. So, we keep reminding our other friends no, in the practice that if you stop at VAs, you will never see your work implemented. You have to work towards getting it into the LTIP or the AIP, in the Annual Investment Plan, every year. The planning cycle of the Philippines starts binago na kasi ngayon, no? It will start in January with the bottom-up planning. No? So, we need to influence the LGUs as early as January. Ano yung yari po kasi sa, sa iba sa atin, we make our interventions later of the year or around September, wala na yun. Uh, Nakaplano na sila. So, for example, the intervention for this year will already be for 2014. For 2014, hindi na siya for 2013. So, uh, this is how we operationalize it, sir. Now, I did not discuss this in detail, but each of these sections will see you take the LGU step by step until we are able to mainstream DRR and CCA at least no, in the annual investment plan. So, uh, ang target niya talaga na dumating siya sa pag-develop ng DRR and CCA options. Ito po, no? at least for now, help them try to really have informed choices on how they can reduce exposure sensitivity and develop adaptive capacity uh, and then get it into the, the planning, uh, you know, the, the development framework. I'll give you one example, sir. Uh, this is really confusing. Nalilito ngayon yung LGUs, no? Ito yes. sa LDR and sure. pa lang. Mas madali pa nga siyang ipasok eh, sa annual investment plan kesa sa ginawa ng COA na to. Risk assessments, although mentioned in the law as fundable by the, by the LDRR and F, sa COA guideline, hindi ko siya nakapasok. Wala yung prevention kasi sa kanilang codes. Wala yung prevention at mitigation. Nakakasulat ako, relief, recovery, preparedness, and mitigation projects. Pero nandito yung training. So, how do LGUs, uh, you know, uh, you know, because to, to debate on this will take another year. You know? So, ang ginawa nila, lahat ng, lahat ng risk assessment, tinansform nila into action-oriented risk assessment in the form of action research so that it becomes a training, but at the same time, we have already complete output on risk assessments. So, yun po, yung ginawa. So, that's how we, we try to operationalize it. Yeah, it's good. Actually, it's good in paper. Ang problema natin is actual implementation. Ang mga nakodan is, it will be mandatory on the part of TPM and the part of the uh, uh, whatever agency, the ALG, whoever, to implement the na mandatory ang requirement before the AIP. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the... And ma-prepare ma na sa pain gagawa. Kasi apparently, marami tayong something similar ni Paz, pero nobody gets penalized uh -huh. for that. Apparently, sir, a memorandum circular to mainstream DRR and CCA predates the law. No? Uh, that's memorandum circular 208-69 of the DILG. No? So, hindi pa yan po nap napapalitan. No? So, meron ganun. Ang question, sir, do they get penalized if they, don't, if they don't mainstream? Actually, if they don't come up with their DRRM plan, they will not be able to use their, NDR, their LDRRMF. So, that's penalty enough. Remember, currently, yung LDRRMF nila or yung Local Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund, the five percent is not the floor. Uh, it's not the ceiling. It is the floor. So they can actually budget for higher LDRRMF. So pag hindi sila gumawa no, hindi nila magagalaw yung pera. Uh, it's final comment. Yes, so, uh, are, have the policy makers and the lawmakers aware of this kind of ano? Kasi ilan lang nakakaintindi sa pagdating. And then here comes election again. Then there's the politics of this thing. Okay, sir. Uh, currently po, there's an initiative, no, uh, under the law, uh, there are to be DRM training institutes. The first has been launched in the Climate Change Academy of Albay. And then we partnered with the Climate Change Academy of Albay to, to help share this information to different regions in the Philippines. No? So currently, 
ang sinisurve ko namin ay regions 4 to regions 8. The next one will probably in in other regions. So, but but definitely, sir, uh, there's still a problem of, of you know getting this information across many other stakeholders. As I said, um, we have 44,000 barangays. We have 1,000 plus municipalities. So far, we only target about 20 per run. No, so ilan lang yung nakakaala. Plus, we still do not know the the rate of the transfer of knowledge. No, within LGU. So, uh, I know there's development communications here, for example, no, in, in UPLP. It's something that you might, you might want to help the other stakeholders. Uh, you know, if you can design a way by which you can get this across more effectively, that would be great. Thank you. So, thank you, po, sir, for your comments and your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I am uh, Lorenzo Mauricio, a forester. Yes, sir. And uh, you mentioned some problems in the uplands. I would like to express uh, to uh, uh, tell you this group some of my experiences when I was in the service. For example, when I was a, a member of the forestry district in Basilan City, I was instructed by the district forester to convince. Uh, the people in the islands uh, outside the uh, south of uh, Basilan, Basilan Island to, to conserve their mangroves and uh, several islands that we visited they did not like the conservation because according to them that is where they make their living for uh, when they cut this the, the mangrove trees for firewood, serve them to the uh, restaurants, to the uh, 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 bakeries like this, and this is where they get money. So, when we insisted, they imprisoned us in the house because accordingly they wanted to kill us, but uh, a companion of ours, uh, a Muslim, showed us how to escape. So, we, well, I will not tell you how to escape. It, it, it may not be applicable now at the present. And then, another uh, experience was when I was with the uh, uh, ERDB here now, uh, after my PhD thesis. Well, my BS thesis was on uh, reforestation. My master's thesis was on timber stand improvement and my PhD thesis was on the effect, the ecological effect of selective logging uh, in Soligao, Pico area in Soligao. And because of this, I was uh, uh, admitted by the International Union of Forest Research Organization and Headquarters of Paris to represent the Philippines in regional seminars here in Southeast Asia. And for the last eight years in, in this service, I traveled uh, throughout Southeast Asia and tried to uh, uh, discuss with the various governments on, and the institutions on reforestation, on selective logging, and uh, I do not know if they implemented, they believe or they implemented. And then, uh, I also worked for 11 years in the logging industry. We related these uh, projects in Mutuan City. We lived in Mutuan City for seven years as a research forester of Pacific Number Company and affiliated companies. Yes, uh, Dr. Mauricio, sorry to cut you. What is the question? My question now is how can we convince the local governments, officials, to, co to coordinate or uh, to cooperate uh, and implement technologies for uh, adaptive uh, and uh, what about uh, climate change, uh, prevent climate change disasters. Because are, are, are they ready to accept technologies? Uh, actually, sir, I thank you for your uh, insights. Uh, uh, you know, sir, right now there's a lot of appreciation with your four mangroves because of the rate of storm surges 
that uh, our communities are now experiencing. Uh, the, the mangrove seems to be the more cost-effective way to prevent storm surges. Kasi kung di sila magmamangrove, kailangan nila ng billion, million, million, o billion, billion para sa seawall. Okay? Wala naman tayo ganun pera. So, it's actually a cheaper way. So, there's, I, I tell you, there's a lot of appreciation for mangroves. Uh, the, the experience in Davao has taught many a lesson. And in fact, there we will turn really to foresters. Kasi hindi naman kayo mapapagkat na alam namin kung paano magdanin. And the problem in Mindanao is a lot of their upland communities, upland areas of Mindanao, are actually plantations. Isang variety na. So if you've actually seen images post-Pablo, pag isang variety na po ang tinanin, kung naputo yung isa, kubos lahat. Kaya po, the direction now might be really reforestation, hindi plantation. So, we we just need to explore and revisit that again. Thank you, Pusat.